your business partner, Alan. We kind of want to know what are the pros and cons of working with Kevin. Ah, uh-huh, Kevin. What Do is you guys like know... one major pro? One is major. One major con of working with Kevin. And he's uh, he's he... gonna be on our next episode. So he's back. Oh, back. he is on the next episode. Yeah. We'll, we'll get Kevin's answer. <laughs> okay. Nice. Okay. Wow. So uh, pros and cons. The the obvious pro is you have a different perspective on the same circumstances. So yeah. Kevin and I, when we first got together, we were a couple sort of bodybuilder bros who, who we didn't realize why we complimented yeah. each other so well. And so uh, in hindsight, what's been really cool about working with Kev is that we have the same challenge in business and he sees it a completely different way than I do. Yeah. We have the same core aspirations, so similar goals. We have very similar core values, particularly with self-improvement. Um, but we have very different, uh, insecurities. Mm, yeah. So we have a same core wound too. So he grew up without a father as well. So I, my father died when I was two years old. His father left when, when he was born and he didn't meet his father till he was 27. And so we had the same sort of self-worth core wound, not having mm-hmm. a dad being raised by two women. He was raised by his mom and his Mima, his grandma. I was kind of raised by my older sister and my mom. And so we had the same core wound, we had the same aspirations, we had the similar core values of self-improvement, but we had very different perspectives. He was way yes. more short-term, way more profitability focused. I was way more long-term and impact focused. And mm-hmm. we ended up complementing each other really well. And now I've since realized that in business in particular, you have to balance long-term vision optimism with short-term productive paranoia. And so he's kind of been the productively paranoid, hey, we might go out of business, we might go out of business, we might go out of business. And I've been, it's all going to work out, it's all going to work out, it's all going to work out. And in hindsight, we're actually flipping a little bit now, which is cool. Now I'm Mm, like, dude, I don't know, man. Uh, So we've driven, we call it drive to five. Uh, The the extremes of thinking and everything's a duality. And so last part of my answers would would be this. People say, well, you got to work harder. Well, for some people who don't work hard, that's great advice. But for people who already work really hard, that's not great advice. And Mm -hmm. so the best part about having a business partner was driving to five. Whenever we disagreed Mm -hmm. with something, we handled it and we both learned and we got closer to what's optimal, the optimal stopping problem. And then what's the downside? Uh, There have been times where I've had to agree to disagree. And, and so for example, we have this, this journal, the dreamliner and my pen just flung across the room, uh, Mm -hmm. this journal (laughs) and, and the way I want it structured, he disagreed with. And he said, Alan, if we're selling a journal to people like you, there is no market for that. You're a weirdo, (laughs) you know? Uh, so we need to make it palatable for other people and no one wants to, you know, redesign their whole world every day like you. So, the downside of having a business partner has been these tough moments of conflict, having to not compromise, but integrate his, his desires with mine, even on the podcast too. And I know you two deal with this probably as well. Sometimes he wants to talk about something and I don't even want to talk about it. Mm. And other, other times I can't wait to talk about success or external fulfillment or, or how to achieve things, manifest things. He's more internal. I'm more external. He's more paranoid. I'm more optimistic. So the, the pro is we learn a lot and we drive to five and we become way more holistic. The, the downside, the con is sometimes you got to agree to disagree and kind of maybe talk about something you normally wouldn't. Mm -hmm. Uh, Wow. All right. A question answered. Roll the intro. So, first of all, thank you for the, the introduction of you and, uh, and Kevin as business partners. But now we're going to focus on you, Alan. So, who is Alan? Alan is a CEO and founder, co-host of Peak Performance and Business Coaching. He combines technical expertise and business acumen to help business maximize growth, impact, profitability online. Following a life-changing accident... The car accident at the age of 26, Alan embarked on a self-improvement journey inspired by Bronnie Ware's book, The Top Five Regrets of Dying. And Tony Robbins' TED Talk, his heart-driven yet no-nonsense approach focuses on motivating and educating others to reach their full potential. 
leading a global team of, tw of 21, Alan is nearing 10,000 hours of speaking, podcasting, training, and coaching. His mission is to help others achieve both success and fulfillment in life. So Alan, tell us more about peak performance. So the thing that I talked about earlier, the drive to five. So peak performance, what does that even mean? When I did my coaching journey, I have this 10,000 hour tracker and it's mm. podcasting, speaking, coaching, training. And I, I essentially track every speech, every coaching session. I, I, it's, it's, it's been a magnificent journey, quite frankly. But anyway, seven years ago, I started coaching. I started as a fitness coach. Then I was a mindset coach. Then I was a life coach. Then I was a peak performance coach. Then I was a business consultant. And now I've landed on business coaching. So I've done a lot of sort of exploring all the different ways to, you can coach people. And so yeah. what does peak performance mean? Peak performance is a metaphor two two ways. So it's practical and it's metaphorical. So on this, for example, this journal, there's a mountain with a star at the top. The peak of the mountain is what we're trying to get to, but life is an infinite game. So we're climbing a mountain that gets higher as you climb it. You're never yeah. going to be done with life until after death, mortality. Mm -hmm. So the, it's a metaphor in the sense of choose your mountain, climb it, uh, make sure it's a meaningful climb. People say it's about the yeah. journey, not the destination, but the problem is the destination you choose in advance dictates the journey. I often say when I was in my early twenties, I drove from Boston to LA. I lived in LA for a time. And I say that journey was very different with a different destination than driving 30 minutes south. I see you've got your cat <laughs> as well. <laughs> cat comes in. Nice. I've, I actually have my pets in my office too uh -huh. uh, right now. So every other week, we're very, very grateful to have an awesome housekeeper. Her name's Cleoji. And I have the pets <laughs> in my office during that time because my girlfriend and I have home offices that we work from. And my cat yeah. is right in front of my laptop, too. So I, <laughs> when I saw that on your screen, I was like, is my cat in my shot? <laughs> Synchronicity. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Ali was like so focused on, on, your, on the conversation. And he's just like ignoring the cat just walking around. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> nice. That's peak so, performance. No matter what distractions come my way. I'm prepared exactly. to filter out the distraction, focus on the main goal. This podcast. That's peak performance right there. That's peak performance. Hell yeah. <laughs> Booyah. So whatever peak you want to get to, you have to choose that destination in advance and make sure it's meaningful. So that's, that's peak performance, the first part. The second part, I think more importantly, is the Goldilocks thing. Too much, too little. Too hot, mm. too cold. Too. So, so for example, some people work too much and they burn themselves out. Other people work too little and they're lazy and they don't achieve their goals. So the advice that I give to one person might be bad for another. Peak performance is this idea of if you picture a graph x y axis and picture an upside down curve like a, a horseshoe, the max of that is is the optimal stopping problem between too much and too little. Okay, yeah. so too much hard work and you burn yourself out and your performance drops because you're on the other side of that curve. If too little work and you don't hit the peak, you don't hit your peak. And so for every workout, for every podcast, for every, for every time you set an intention and a goal, there's an optimal stopping problem. Even right now telling this story, there's certain people that I've already lost. Mm -hmm. So I need to shush <laughs> and get to the next question because I've reached past the optimal stopping problem of this. So peak performance is how do you stay near that peak? And consistently and sustainably learn how to stay near that peak in your life. What's the right amount of okay. sleep? What's the right amount of hydration? All that kind of stuff. Go ahead. Getting in the flow. That's part of it too now. Yes. Let's talk about why we do what we do. All right. I'm here on this life and every day I'm making a million decisions. What am I going to do today? I wake up. I'm like, okay, I got some work to do. I got a podcast to do. I got to do a workout. I got to sleep. I got to eat. I got to do so many decisions every single day. Now, part of my problem is I'm trying to figure out how to say no to different things. And then also finding out what to say yes to. Because right now I'm at the point where I have a lot of um, creativity, a lot of potential, a lot of different things I'm interested in doing, but in order to climb the mountain, I need to be more focused and zoned in. Okay. 
which brings me to the question why. Why am I doing what am I doing? Why am I doing this podcast? Let me ask you first, Alan, before we go. Alan, why do you do your podcast? So why is the existential question? And you two are existentialists. Otherwise, you wouldn't have asked the question. And what, <laughs> what an existentialist means is what's the point? Why yeah. do we exist? What's the point? And I think the only wrong answer is to not ask the question. So I think you can live that question. Why? Why, why does this even matter? Why am I even on this show right now? Why do I do my podcast? The, the best answer that I can come up with is, is it's, I have this sort of Venn diagram that I'm writing a blog about right now where on, on the bottom left, the picture three circles, the bottom left is what fulfills you. That's number one. Number two is what you're really good at. And then number three is what makes good money. Mm. And I think that myself included, we, we go to the wrong one first. So for me, my mom said, you're good at math. Engineers make a lot of money. You should be an engineer. Mm -hmm. And so I did that. And then I found myself working for a company called Tyco Safety Products. I had a summer internship after uh, being in tech school, a technical college called WPI, kind of like a mini MIT. And I hate, I was sitting behind a desk all summer designing circuits and I hated it. I absolutely hated it. And so, yeah, it made great money. And eventually I was an inside sales engineer and then I was an outside sales engineer. I made really good money and the world needs engineers right now. So engineers are very sought after. So I'm very grateful, but it's not what I, it not, it's not what fulfills me. And so why do we do our podcast? Number one, personal development, personal growth, self-improvement, whatever label you want to give it. I am just obsessed. I love it. I absolutely adore it. So that's number one. Uh, number two, it's actually what I wish that I had when I was younger. So I grew up in an environment, my mom and my stepdad. So I had a stepdad from age three to 14. And my mom and stepdad didn't get along. Uh, and that's put, putting it very politely. And I grew up in an environment in the late 90s, early 2000s, where there was no personal development. I, I mean, there was, but it wasn't in my radar at all. Mm -hmm. There was no personal growth. There was no audible. There was, I mean, YouTube was, wasn't around back then. Th this, this idea that you can work on yourself and when you improve, everything in your life improves around you. Because I grew up in an environment, my father passed away. My mom and stepdad didn't get along. My stepdad left at 14, took his entire family with him. I haven't seen any of the Lazaruses since. My real last name is actually McCorkle. I took his last name at seven. Mm -hmm. and yeah. I couldn't, I couldn't change m my circumstances externally, but, I, but I, I, my trauma response to all that hardship and adversity was aim higher, work harder, get smarter. After 26, I got in my own car accident and I, I just flipped the script and I went all in on self-improvement. So, so the long winded answer to your question, why we do our podcast, the tagline version is Next Level University is holistic self-improvement in your pocket, anywhere on the planet, completely free every single day. 1% improvement per day. That can change your whole world. I grew up in a country that invested in me. I didn't have enough money to go to college and I got scholarships and financial aid and I was able to go to school and I was able to get out of my environment. I was able to, to grow and expand and become a successful person. And I believe in open source knowledge. If you have an open heart, and, and an open mind and you're willing to put in work and that's the key. You have to be willing to work. Then I want NLU yeah. to be a place that you can come. NLU is the mentor I never had. It's the male role model Kevin and I never had. And hopefully it is anyways. And so now mm -hmm. that that's really the why underneath it at this point, even though in the beginning I didn't really know that it's just in hindsight, I kind of uncovered the meaning as we went. Mm -hmm. What is it about, suppression when you're younger about anything that makes you want to get it get after when you're older you know so like for you when you were a kid you didn't have that kind of leadership mentor example someone to guide you and then you didn't have that um self-development thing until you get older you know until you got older and then it took an accident for you to be like, okay, now I'm all in. And now you're all in. Now you're like, 
I'm going to consume as much as possible. I'm going to create as much as possible. This is going to be my life. Self-improvement, development. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, I wonder I think, what that's about. I think a lot of us, we, whatever's caused you the most pain, usually there's, we run in the opposite direction of that. And so for me, there was no self-improvement, no personal development, no personal growth. If my mom and stepdad were into personal growth, my whole world would have been different. And so, of course, we run in the opposite direction of our deepest pains and our deepest fears. And so I think that's what it was, is just let me let me run in the opposite direction. So when my stepdad left, he got the yacht in the apartment building. We got the house and the dog. But after that, we were broke. So I went from early Christmas presents, Dreamcast, Xbox, you know, he worked for a company called Agfa in the late 90s, early 2000s, dot-com bubble stuff. We did well. And when he left, I got free lunch at school because our income was so low. I didn't know how I was going to get go to college because the college I wanted to go to was $50,000 a year back then. And, and so I, was, <laughs> I, I ran in the other direction of my pain, which was I need to make as much money as possible so that I can take care of my family. And then after that car accident, my existential crisis, my quarter life crisis, I call it, I realized, okay, I'm making now almost $200,000 a year. It didn't solve anything. I paid off 84 grand worth of debt in a single year, college debt. I had $150,000 in Vanguard and investment account, different tech companies and ETFs and stocks. And I wasn't fulfilled at all. So a lot of times you have to get the thing that you think is going to fulfill you to realize it doesn't fulfill you. And then what do you do? You flip the script. And so I went internal after that. But most people, you either, I, I've noticed this in coaching because I've coached so many people now at this point. There's professional development over here and then there's personal development over here. And some people very rarely do both consistently. But I know mm. some people that are heart-driven, holistic, emotionally intelligent, wonderful human beings who don't have the hard skills and often don't win in the economy but they're the most magnificent people you've ever met. And then there's these professionals, like some of the people I went to college with, these engineers that, that have hard skills out the wazoo, who, who are coders and, and they make very good money, but they still are children emotionally. And they didn't do the inner work. And that's where I was headed. You know, I was externally improved. I was achievement oriented. I was goal oriented, but I wasn't self-improvement oriented. And so usually it's righty or lefty. Very few of us are ambidextrous. And I think as you mature in life, hopefully you become ambidextrous. But for me, prior to the car accident at 26, I hadn't done a lot of self-reflection. I, I was doing goal achievement, but I wasn't doing therapy and mental health. Mm -hmm. And in my thirties, I started doing therapy and mental health work. And that's been just such a game changer for me. But some of the people that are already doing that, what they really need is the hard skills and the, and the development, the resume, the cover letter, the, the LinkedIn, the, 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 the you know, so yeah, the skills and the professional development is over here. The personal development and the inner work is over here. And if you want to be a leader in the 21st century, I think you need to, to have both. Oh my gosh. Said, what do you think about that? Let's talk about, you have, you haven't been reflecting too much. I want to hear about your why and about what you think about, those two things that Alan was talking about. I completely agree. Like, that's why I've been silent. Just I'm listening to Alan. I'm just agreeing with all the points he's making. It's, it's kind of, I know I shouldn't be speechless on a it's podcast. It's a podcast, bro. <laughs> <laughs> You're supposed to contribute. <laughs> you guys are funny. <laughs> but, but no, those are very good points. Like, you're very right. A lot of people just either hard lean into one side of the either the right hemisphere or the left hemisphere. And then it just, it leaves them like kind of lost or missing out on something in their lives. Uh, yep. and it's hard to do. Maybe it's just hard to do both at the same time for people. Cause like it's a slow progression. And I feel like people tend to want to chase the quick, the quick results. They want to see the, the outcome of their work much sooner. They're not willing to wait and take their time with their growth so that they can see the best outcome for themselves as human beings. They want to, they want to chase down like one dream and say that like, this is it, this is for me. I guess, and I guess that's, it makes sense because we're kind of like taught 
when we're young, we're just constantly taught like you have to pick one career and just you have to focus on that, ignore everything else, you know, just like this is your primary focus and do not get lost with whatever distractions that come your way. So then you lose the fun in life. But then the people who do fall into those distractions, they become they have too much fun and then they just lose lose sight on where their career is heading. Yep. So like, how, how do you find the balance between those two? Yeah, that I, I use the word harmony instead of balance, but either way. Mm. And yeah. I think it's a pendulum. You know, yeah. I, I remember in middle school, I was really popular and outgoing. And I was everything for everyone and, and a social butterfly. And then in high school, I didn't hit puberty. Everyone else did. I'm still hoping to hit it by 36, fellas. We want to see a bit of that facial hair, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I think it'll come in a couple of years. You know what I'm saying? So uh, maybe 37 is my year, fellas. But uh, th- 36, I'm 35. But anyway, so in middle school, I was social butterfly. Yeah, uh, That was the Backstreet Boys era, and I had the, the long blonde hair. And then in high school, I was a nerd and just straight A student and Mm -hmm. didn't hit puberty. And I was red faced and shy and lost a lot of my confidence. And then I grew. I finally kind of hit puberty in my junior year uh, a little bit. And I grew and then I was a social butterfly again. And then in college, I partied and all that. And then I, after 26, I went back into sort of self reflection mode. And I think that that's the thing, right? You've got these people who are extremely, extremely socially oriented. And and to your point, they have a lot of fun. That was me in college. I had a lot of fun, but I didn't focus enough, in my opinion. I did well enough. I got a 3.4, but what? I mean, I drank too much and too often. I partied all the time. I had so many college friends and high school friends and corporate friends once I was in corporate. And it, in hindsight, I do. I regret a lot of that. Now, did I develop social skills? Yes. Did I develop? Am I one of the few engineers? Uh, I don't want to say this. I kind of will, though. Am I one of the <laughs> engineers who can communicate effectively with other people and interact with other people really well? So there's a lot of benefits to those years because I know some engineers who don't know how to communicate mm-hmm. at all and, and they yeah. struggle. And I understand. I do. And I think all engineers struggle a little bit with self-worth because we're such weirdos. But anyways, so... <laughs> There's benefits to it, but how do you not swing the pendulum so damn far? And so I think life is this pendulum where, okay, well, too much over here. And then I go back and I, and I overcorrect too much over here. And then I go back and I overcorrect, but not as much as the last time. And then I go back and I think eventually you kind of find center, but then as you get older, you zoom in and, and it still feels like you're swaying a lot. You're just not swaying. I mean, everyone, I always do this in my speeches. I say, everyone think of something idiotic you did in high school. And everyone immediately is like, oh, yeah, got one. I said, you would never do that again. And they said, uh, there's one kid in the audience. No, I would. <laughs> it's like, okay, <laughs> well, you're not thinking of what I'm thinking of then. But anyways, so uh, it's funny. Think of the thing that you did in high school that you would never do again. Mm-hmm. Like right now. Imagine doing that right now. You, would, That'd be cringy. you wouldn't do it. I, I always be, say, uh, just, uh, <laughs> cringe yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah, exactly. Cringe. Yeah. It would be social suicide. So, <laughs> okay, fair. So, 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 exactly. You got, you guys wouldn't do that again. Okay, why? Right. That's what we're talking about this podcast. Why? Yeah. Because you are now more intelligent, and you now understand the long term detriment or potential long term detriment of that terrible choice. So we matured. We got smarter. We got older. We grew up. Some of us, right? Yeah. But that pendulum still swings because in five years from now, you're going to think the same thing of the stuff you're doing now. Yeah. Oh, I should never have interviewed that's that true. Alan guy. You know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, that's <laughs> what I'm thinking. <laughs> Already. In the future, I'm going to look back. I'm going to be like, cringe. Seven minutes you know? Man, yeah. It's like wasting our time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's called going into the future, feeling the regret in advance, and making a more intelligent choice. So. I'll take off. All right. <laughs> <laughs> what about what about regret? I know regret is a big part of your life. Do you want to tell us more about that? Yeah. So I think the two best teachers in the world are fulfillment and regret. Hmm. Whenever I do something. So for example, Emilia and I, we just went on a trip. We Her parents have a place in South Carolina. 
and we live in Massachusetts. So we drove eight states down to South Carolina. It was a week. We did three days there, three days back, stayed a couple days in South Carolina. I think it was two days there, two days back, and then four days in South Carolina. It doesn't matter. The point is, it was a great trip. Uh, we had a hotel room on the way there, hotel room on the way back. We hiked a mountain. We did a lot in a single week. I'm reflecting on that experience. And on the drive back from South Carolina, her and I did an experience review. And she has her iCloud notes up. And she said, okay, what, what, what were the most important wins? What were the most important uh, lessons? And, and what are we going to do differently next time? Like, what can we improve? And there was a, there was a bunch. I mean, this was our first road trip together. We've been together five years, but we, this is the first time we did. That was her first road trip ever. She's 29. I'm 35. And we have so many improvements, but to go back to regret and fulfillment. Okay. What was fulfilling in hindsight? Okay. We hiked that mountain. That was awesome. Okay. We're not going to eat at checkers again because I ate too much and I felt sick the next day. Checkers is a fast food joint. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mm -hmm. Okay. That place Del Sur was awesome. Holy crap. That was delicious. Right? So you just reflect and you go, I regret eating all that checkers except for the checker burger. That thing was awesome. That was real good. (laughs) Yeah. So if I go back to checkers, I'm going to get two of those, you know, and a Sprite or whatever. And that's it because I learned the other stuff sucks. So I think regret and fulfillment are the best teachers. When you're fulfilled, there's a reason. Fulfillment is a formula. Mm -hmm. Reflect on your experiences and say, I always do this in my coaching sessions. When were you the most fulfilled? And you can think of a time in your life where you're the most fulfilled. And if you can't say right right now. now? Yeah, of course. Did it say right now? Said, what do you think? What what, what do you think? When were you the most fulfilled? I'm curious about Said's reflections. The first thing that popped in my head was uh, when I was president of the, the Red Cross branch in my university. I felt really good about that because... I wasn't even applying for that position. I was applying for the vice president. And when I got the role, I was just like, I was shocked about it. And, but at the same time, excited. And it felt really good. Like, I felt like I was like, that's where I had, I was supposed to be felt. It felt good being in that position. It was a lot of pressure and responsibility because I was responsible for like over 200 people, 200, over 200 volunteers. And from the, from the get go, we had a lot of pressure from the administration. They were within the first week, they were threatening to shut down the branch because of (laughs) the previous, the previous committee's work. And because of the new president. (laughs) (laughs) oh this guy won we're out you know (laughs) the first week he's not he's not on the job no we got to get him out here yeah but yeah it um it was a great experience for me i learned quite a lot from it and the skills that i acquired from it were I i will never forget them plus the the connections i made the friends that I got to hang around with, like I really got to know who really are my friends who would really help me out. Just all in all, great experience, I would say. Nice. nice. So there's so like much to learn in that. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, that's a great one. You were contributing. You felt an alignment. I heard so much in there. There's gold in there. You were contributing. You were responsible mm-hmm. for a lot. So taking on responsibility, we think is a pain in the butt, and it is, let's be honest. But it fulfills yeah. us. It fulfills yeah, us. Yeah, that's true. You, you were doing meaningful work in the world. You, the relationships around you were other people who want to contribute because it's volunteers. There's, there's so many clues. Mm. Most people go on to the next experience. Go on to the next experience. If I was coaching you, which I'm not right now, <laughs> uh, I would say <laughs> look at that, mine for the gold, and then design your life around what that was. Because if you can't mm. honestly answer that you're the most fulfilled right now, that means something has been lost in in translation. Something hasn't hasn't landed fully that needs to land. And maybe maybe you should go back and volunteer for Red Cross. I don't know. I don't know what that logistical thing is, but I do know if you can't mm-hmm. say 
I am honestly the most fulfilled I've ever been right now, that means there's something to go back into your past and say, okay, what am I missing from this equation that I once used to have? Maybe it was a past girlfriend or different friends that you don't spend time with anymore, or maybe maybe you were volunteering, or maybe you were the president responsible for something meaningful. Like there's so much to learn in that. And I think a lot of us don't want to reflect on the past because we it's painful. Mm-hmm. And and we we just spearhead in the future, but we don't learn from the past. And so I'm 35 and I try to re-watch the movie of my own life every year. Uh and really every day in some ways. And I, I also have a great memory, so I'm grateful for that. But even my story I told you guys earlier, I didn't understand any of that in my 20s. I never even talked about my father's death when I was in my 20s. I avoided yeah. that unconsciously because it was so painful. So it, it took me until 27 years old to talk about it at all. Um, so there's so much gold in, in reflecting on the past and learning about what fulfills you and, and what you regret as well. So uh, go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Yeah, perfect. Said, do you have an extra comment or have another question? Uh, no, I, I want to return the question to you, Ali. What, what, is, uh, your, what is the major fulfillment in you flip you the can script remember from your memories? Hmm. <laughs> the tables have turned. Uh, no, um, yeah, to be honest, then reflecting on what Alan is saying, I do agree. I would say right now is when I'm the most film filled maybe I've ever been, um, relationship wise, career wise, financially. Podcast um, guest wise. Podcast guest wise. Hell yeah. To- <laughs> <laughs> no, but yeah, even with this podcast, my hobbies, my ambitions, everything's very on point. Everything's in line. I keep um physically I'm, you know, doing the best I've ever been. Just everything about myself really. I'm I'm so uh you know. Sometimes I'm very I'm hu- I'm a hustler, I like to work, but then sometimes it's nice to pause and reflect and I feel proud of myself. I feel of all I've accomplished. And not to be, yeah, uh, cringy or whatever that is, but um, it's just uh, how I feel. And I'm really happy with everything. And um, every time I do, you know, a podcast and, you know, there's a great guest on like yourself, Alan, I feel like, wow, like we're doing this. We're living life. We're creating stuff. This is this is it. This is life. I'm just going to keep writing this and going through this roller coaster. So that's um, awesome. Yeah, that's my answer, Saeed. You're welcome. So, <laughs> you're welcome. You're thank welcome. you so much, Ali. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, oh, damn, I'm not as fulfilled as I once was. You know? <laughs> the other guy's like, I think now, 100%, I'm, I'm the man, actually. I'm the man. No. <laughs> but honestly, truth be told, we, we are so afraid to talk about our successes and our struggles. That's awesome. Good mm-hmm. for you. And here's the real cool thing underneath that fulfilled people don't hurt others, they don't want to hurt others. So you're not tearing other people down. You're not bullying anybody, uh, except for Saeed, obviously. I'm joking. Uh, <laughs> but, but the point is, is fulfilled people, they just want to see other people fulfilled. I don't, I don't sit behind a keyboard and try to hate on people's lives. And, mm-hmm. and so I think fulfillment is what we're all after. And mm. I think everyone can achieve it. And some, for some of us, it's harder than others. It's taken me a long time to be fulfilled because uh, my ACE score was very high. Adverse childhood experiences, there's a score, there's a test you mm-hmm. can take. And my ACE score was extremely high and I had to work through a lot of stuff. But at the end of the day, fulfillment and regret. Reflect what fulfilled you, what didn't, why didn't it, what did you regret? If you were honest, the regret thing's hard for people because people mm-hmm. have that whole hang up of, well, if I... Re- if I didn't do that, I wouldn't have gotten here. Okay. Yeah. Let's think about this rationally for a second. If that's the case, then why change anything ever? Why learn anything? Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay. Am I glad I got here? Am I glad for some of those poor decisions that I made that I got to meet Emilia and I have my podcast and I have my business and I'm fulfilled where I am? So yes, that's great. But that doesn't mean that I can't, I couldn't have done any better. And this is one of those things that's hard for the brain because we say, well, would I have met my beautiful girlfriend, Emilia, if I didn't go through that back in college? Okay, but you did meet her. And now that you've met her and now you're with her, the love of your life, best thing that's ever happened to me, can you reflect back and realize some of those choices were pretty terrible? 
What yeah. is the point of growth if not to make bigger, better, brighter cho choices, if not to build a bigger, better, brighter future, right? And so a lot of people mm -hmm. get hung up on the regret thing. They don't want to feel regret. They don't want to own it. I regret drinking so much. I used to drink so much. I, I poisoned my brain. I poisoned my body. It took me five years to quit drinking. I'm now five years, I think like five years. I used to count the days. I don't anymore. But I, mm -hmm. the point is, is I have regrets and I owned them. Mm -hmm. And ironically... The people who didn't own those regrets and didn't feel those regrets and didn't admit those regrets never transformed. Wow. That is true. Yeah, I completely um, agree with that. Yeah, for me, it's um, on the relationship aspect, I would say, you know, like uh, my relationship, I'm super happy romantically and such. But then in the past, I wasn't always as nice or as kind as I am right now. And, and that wasn't because in the beginning, I didn't know what this was going to end up being, you know, so I wasn't, you know, the, the best version of myself towards her, to be completely honest. And that part, those parts I regret, you know, I always, <laughs> I always think back to those days where, you know, just um, not being so nice or saying rude things or stuff like that. And it's not the best version of me. And yeah. I want to make sure that I don't do that again. So I have learned from those experiences, I would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's one. Those are some of my regrets. I mean, I'm curious about, we were talking about the balance between emotional intelligence and career intelligence or something like that. But um, I wonder how that aligns with you being in a romantic relationship. We've been talking, hinting about this a little bit throughout this podcast. What is that like for you? I'm very go, go, go. I'm very like, you know, driven. I can sit on my computer and work all day and I'm, you know, a hustler. I want to do things. But um, yeah, having the, the balance of having a partner who is more emotionally intelligent, who's more, um, you know, finds joy in the simpler things. It's It's been nice for me to have that balance, to have to be more chill and side will call me domesticated. That's okay. Maybe I am. <laughs> I was thinking it. I was, thinking <laughs> indoor cat. I was like, when, when in, is the right cat. time to say the word? When <laughs> is the right time to say it? <laughs> Maybe I'm an indoor outdoor cat. How about that? Nice. <laughs> yeah. Ambivert. Nice. Let's go. <laughs> uh, well, the first, the first thing that I would say with that is you've been enjoying that and that's been fulfilling for you. And, mm -hmm. If you're right, if you're wrong about one thing, you're kind of wrong about everything. And, and this is something that I didn't learn until my thirties. I used to wonder, and you talked, by the way, first of all, good for you for admitting that your imperfections in the past and feeling the emotions of how poorly you behaved and how you weren't the best version of yourself. The first step to getting better is admitting that you are not doing as well as you want to do. And for men in particular, that's hard. Because we're so insecure about incompetence, it's ridiculous. I often joke. I say men can't even ask for directions. Yeah, never mind, get a therapist. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> so uh, I didn't start doing therapy till my 30s. What a giant L that is! Holy crap! It's been nothing short of transforming. But anyways, so this this question that you have, so Emilia and I. Not only do most marriages, intimate relationships, we're not married yet, but there's a large percentage um, of people who end up divorced, okay? And also the statistics in business are also, most businesses fail within a 10-year period. I think it's 90 plus percent. And so Emilia and I decided to go into business together. <laughs> so not only do you have a low chance of success, statistically speaking, in an intimate relationship or a marriage, but you also have a low chance of success with business. So we joke, we say we decided to tackle both simultaneously. So we have a business together. It's called the Conscious Couples Podcast. The business is called yeah. The We, which is the two me's plus the we. And we coach intimate relationships. So we coach couples all over the world. It's really been quite cool. We've been doing it for like three and a half years. Yeah. But the first way to answer your question is it, it's fulfilling for you to be with someone who enjoys the simpler things in life, who maybe isn't as goal oriented as you. For me, that didn't really work for me. And so remember when I said that uh, 
if you're wrong about one thing, you're wrong about everything. I was wrong about one thing. The thing that I was wrong about is I had no idea that other people don't have a lot of self-belief because most people act like they do. And I never used to say this because I was afraid to be villainized. But for those of you out there watching or listening to this, I don't really struggle with self-doubt much. And so if you struggle with self-doubt and don't believe in yourself, I'm going to most likely rub you the wrong way, at least a little bit. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, So I went through my whole childhood thinking, why is everyone so lazy and why is everyone so irrational? Mm -hmm. No, I'm hyper rational and I'm really hardworking. (laughs) But I didn't know that until I started coaching people from all over the world. I started, oh, it's a me issue. I'm the only common denominator in this math equation. So I think in numbers, I'm obsessed with math, science, I call it STEM, but science, technology, engineering, mathematics, business, and finance. Obsessed. Yeah. So so when I was with these past partners, the masculine and the feminine, the polarity, I was always really hardworking. One of my ex-girlfriends said, dating you is like dating a stairmaster. <laughs> <what> she, <laughs> I can relate. What, oh my I god, can, that's a brutal. <laughs> yeah, I can understand. Honestly, this is my tempo. I've exercised every day for the last two and a quarter years, every single day. Now it's only 35. Wow. It started with 30 minutes a day and now it's 35. Emilia and I do it literally over two years straight without a missing it without missing a day. Now I'm weird. I'm really weird. I'm never going to hang out just to hang out. Like I'm not that guy. It took me years to own that. One of the reasons I think I used to drink is it would dial me down. Mm, I was yeah. more fun. I was more playful. I was more present. I'm super future oriented. I'm driven as it gets. And I'm a type A achiever. Always have been, always will be. It's not till my thirties. I started really owning that. But people who are insecure about their self-belief, their achievements, their orientation, their, if they think they're lazy or they're fearful that they're not disciplined, I'm going to trigger all their insecurities. I used to be insecure about other people's insecurities. Now I've worked through a lot of that stuff and I realize, okay, I trigger other people's insecurities, but I'm not going to not be me. And I'm going to try to be my, myself in that. Uh, my fear wasn't, I don't think I can do this. My fear was, you're going to hate me. Kevin and I, business partners, we both speak. We did this one speech. It was 300 middle schoolers. Then it was 300 juniors, uh, sophomores, and freshmen. And then it was juniors and seniors. And we did the same speech three times to three different groups. Fascinating. The the middle schoolers loved us. No ego yet. The sophomores and freshmen, right? They were individuating. A little less. Loved Kevin. Kind of didn't like me. I get it. I do. I get it. (laughs) All right. (laughs) <laughs> try to give a personal development seminar to a group of high school kids. Right. And then the juniors <laughs> and seniors hated, hated us both. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> Just who are these guys? Personal development, get the hell out of here. Right. So, so my point is, is Kev gives a speech and he's afraid he won't add value. I'm not afraid of not adding value. I'll change the way you think. I'll change the way you live. I'll change your life, but I'm afraid you're going to hate me. And if you hate me, you won't listen to me. And if you won't listen to me, I can't have an impact. And by the way, my goals are to have an impact. So how do I get emotionally driven people who don't think like an engineer to actually open open their hearts to me? That's been my life's greatest challenge. So I feel unlovable and unlikable. Kev doesn't worry about that at all. He just feels like, I wonder if I'm going to do well. Am I going to be smart enough or competent enough? So we all have these Mm. two deep wounds. One of them is, I don't feel smart enough. I don't feel good enough. I don't feel hardworking enough. I'm not enough. I don't have that one at all. And if you do, I trigger you. Okay? I have unlovable. If you said, Alan, you have to give a speech in front of a thousand people tomorrow, and you got to talk about peak performance and self-development, I would say, let's rock and roll. And you said, all you have to do is change their lives. I would say, I'm your guy. Let's rock and roll. If you said, you have to get everyone to like you, I would say, that is literally impossible. I cannot do that and be me. I am not an easily likable person. I never have been. Okay. Unfortunately, people who think they want to be like me, actually, I'm jealous of them. I've never fit in. I've never been relatable. I've never been normal. And I never will be. Statistically speaking, I'm an anomaly. And it's taken me 35 years 
to get to the place where I actually love myself for who I really am and stop trying to pretend to be something I'm not. And so that's why in college and high school and corporate, I was such a shell of myself is because I was trying to chameleon my way into being likable when honestly, it's never going to happen. It is what it is. Mm -hmm. That's not my purpose. I'm not here to be likable. I'm here to change people's lives. And some people like me and some people don't. And instead of, oh, I don't care what people think, which is BS, by the way, of course I do. I'm going to sit with that and say, even if you don't like me, that's okay. Because I'm going to do and I'm going to show up anyway and I'm going to try to be the best version of myself and I'm going to be the most virtuous, intelligent man I can possibly become. And that's it. And there, there's, no, I say if I'm going to be hated, I'm at least going to be hated for who I am. And and that's hopefully there's a lesson in that for everybody. Wow. Well, God damn, Alan, you've convinced me, man. That's it. I'm going to sign you as my coach. I want my oh, life wow. changed. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Holy shit, man. I'm shit. I'm, I can't stand anymore. My knees are buckling. <laughs> that was actually really if, if, Shake it off. Shake it off. Sam. That was, shake it off. Okay, yeah, yeah, the I appreciate you. <laughs> if, no, if you are serious, by the way, we'll rock and roll. Yeah. If you're serious. I'll have to consider I have to think about it. I promise but you no, I'm it's... the most affordable. I'm the most affordable business coach you'll have. I can promise you that. Be I've honest, been made if... fun of for my prices. <laughs> Literally. It's like I, the most honest, affordable business coach. Like, <laughs> I don't know if uh, the way you presented it that way was like, is this something you've said the way you said it was, has it, have you said it before exactly like that? Or would you like us to send us this, like a re the, the, this recorded bit so that you can use it? Cause that was really good to be honest. Like this is a very convincing message. Like you can, the way you send it to us, <laughs> I I was uh, honestly convinced like you could definitely change something in my life. And I hope oh, also like you. our audience members, like when they look at it, they'll be like, okay, this is someone that I can actually work with. So thank you. Thank you for that message. Yeah. To be honest, Alan. Like that, that was the that first was way. Thank you so much. That was the first time I articulated it exactly like that because truth be told, I was too much of a coward before to be that honest. Mm. What, so what got you to be, to break out of that shell and be able to be honest? What do you think was the defining factor? The, the healing of the, the exile. So there's a modality of therapy called internal family systems. You guys ever see the movie inside mm -hmm. out? Yeah, of course. Yes. Okay. Okay. So the movie inside out, uh, for anyone watching or listening, there's, there's a little girl who, as she develops, there's a, a different emotions in her brain that run this kiosk. Mm -hmm. So one of them's yeah. joy, one of them's sadness, one of them's disgust and anger and all that stuff. IFS is sort of like this this modality of therapy that talks about different parts of us. So there's a part of me that wants a Big Mac and Coke right now. There's a part of me that is hot and sweaty. There's a part of me that is afraid that you guys won't like me. There's a part of me that wants to add value, like that kind of thing. And I won't go too mm -hmm. deep because there's a whole, this is a whole modality. It's, it's, it gets deep. But the truth yeah. is we all have an exile. And the exile is the part of us that holds our pain and our shame. And for me, my pain was never, I don't feel good enough. It was always being hated or disliked or bullied. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think my stepdad ever wanted kids. I, I was, I was definitely bullied a lot in hindsight mm -hmm. and I never felt easily likable. So when you ask me that question, how have I gotten the courage? The truth is I, I kind of just started to heal and identify and heal and identify this part of me that is holding me back. This, this mm -hmm. need to please, this, there's four trauma responses, fight, flight, and freeze are the ones people know, but the fourth one was the one I didn't learn until my 30s, and it's called fawn. It's to appease. So if anyone mm -hmm. had an overly dominant alcoholic parent, you usually have fawn as your trauma response. Don't poke mm -hmm. the bear. What does the bear need? You, what do you need? Just, just yeah. don't mm -hmm. cause a problem. So fawn was mine. I just learned how to slowly and sustainably stop fawning by standing up to people and speaking up for myself. Uh, and, and that's been really, really quite challenging for me. It's so interesting. Kev has no problem with that. Kev's mm -hmm. afraid about giving the speech and adding value. He thinks he's not smart enough. I'm like, dude, you're going to be fine. But 
he, everyone likes him. He's like the relatable, fun. You guys are going to love Kev. He's the man. He's a great, great guy. He's, he's relatable. He's hilarious, right? I just felt, and you know what's ironic too? My fear of being disliked actually made me less likable. Yeah. No, and so now that I'm because like the security parts plays a plays a role in it. Now that I have the courage to own it, I feel like I will be more liked. It's this weird thing that you just heal and and therapy is the answer. Like I thought it was the next productivity seminar that was going to help me. No. <laughs> Right. And for some people, that's, that is what needs to help them. If you're already emotionally intelligent and well-developed and you've had a journal since you were young and you self-reflect and you've had a therapist for years, you do not need another therapist. You know what you need? You need a coach and you need systems and you need habits and you need structure and metrics. And I'm your guy. Okay. I can't be your therapist because I'm not that good at this stuff, but I can yeah. be your coach. I'm good at achievement. I am not good at what you're asking me now. I'm new to this. I'm like an infant on that side of things. But I've been doing computer engineering. I've been doing system structures and metrics and math and science, technology, engineering, mathematics, business, and finance my whole life. I can't walk into mm -hmm. a Panera without thinking about their profit margin. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. But, but, <laughs> but this inner work stuff, I am a newbie. Do not ask me. My my cat is hammering my my camera. <laughs> this is my cat right now. There you go. We've had two cats yeah. on this interview. Wow! 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 What it's a, a podcast catastrophe! Today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice one, Sai. This is All my right. cat Tauriel. Hi, sweet cow. Hey, and maybe hey, she'll cat, maybe she'll. Yeah, Tauri. Thanks for popping in. I know this got really emotional and deep for all of us. Let's be real. It was. Say, I was. wanted you to reflect about everything you've learned on today's episode. I will, and I will share it with the with the audience. Yes, we learned today point. about. <laughs> okay, Harry, it's fine. <laughs> today we learned a lot about self development, about personal growth, about how to be courageous. And also the final words that Alan was teaching us about is just do therapy, like work on yourself. Alan, thank you so much for being on the podcast and thank you for sharing your, all of your insights and your personal stories with us. This has been, this has been great. And if you can just share with the audience, where can people find you so that they can connect with you? So next level university, first of all, thank you both. I do not take it lightly to have the opportunity to speak into other people's lives. Nine years ago, I started listening to podcasts mm -hmm. and I remember these guests would come on and they'd have these articulate stories and I would wonder, how do they have so much figured out? And now I'm, I'm one of those guys now. <laughs> and so trust me, I didn't have any of it figured out before. This has been an iterative yeah. process for sure. So keep, keep climbing whatever your mountain is and, and believe in yourself more than you do. Um, even if you already do believe in yourself a lot. So thank you both for having me. I appreciate it. It's an honor. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I don't You're take welcome. it lightly. I don't. As for where you can find me, uh, we have a podcast called next level university spelt just like it sounds. Holistic self-improvement in your pocket from anywhere on the planet, completely free, 1% improvement per day. And uh, we have a website called nextleveluniverse.com. Next Level University, the guy is charging way too much. So we were like, mm-mm, <laughs> nextleveluniverse.com. It's going to be all things next level. We have a 21-person team, as you mentioned. We have 21 departments, which is nothing short of overwhelming, to be honest. And uh, we're doing a lot of good work in terms of if, if you're into health, wealth, and love, and you want to level up in your life, love, health, and wealth, it is, check it out. And you can email me, A-L-A-N at nextleveluniverse, spelt just like it sounds, dot com. Just please provide context because like all of us, I get a lot of spam. <laughs> awesome. Love it. Thank you so much, Alan, for being on the podcast. Guys, you know how we end this. And Alan... Just to let you know, we salute to cover the camera. And subscribe. Please. We're out of here. Woo. <laughs>